guys, it's Brie with Calafia Candle Company. Welcome back to my channel. Today's video is going to be an in-depth tutorial on how to make a concrete candle jar. And I already have a few videos on my channel regarding this, but they're a little bit older and I've changed a few things here and there since I've uploaded those videos. So I just wanted to give you guys a more current version and also provide you with a little bit more information as well. So if you're interested, just keep on watching. All right, let's go over materials and supplies you'll be needing for this. Mostly everything I'll be mentioning is from Amazon and I will have my Amazon storefront linked in the description box. I have everything linked there and categorized so it'll be easy for you to find. If it's not from Amazon, I will be sure to mention that. First and foremost, we have our protection. This is very important when you're working with something like cement or concrete because the silica dust is not good for you. Uh, so definitely make sure you're using gloves and some kind of mask. I have my cement all here. I like to empty it out into this large tote. I just find it a lot easier to scoop out of here rather than the bag that it comes in. This is what the original bag looks like that it comes in. So it is the blue and white bag of cement all and I buy this from Home Depot. Then of course we need a mold. This is the three inch tulip mold from Modern Craft Labs. This is in the three inch tall height. They have a couple different height options. And they also have a bunch of other different molds on their website, so I'll be sure to link them down below. I've really enjoyed using this mold. It comes with this little plastic support piece too that kind of helps it keep its circular shape. They're really great quality and I've just found them to last quite a while. I will say that they do shrink over time. That is just something that happens with these molds when you're working with concrete. But it does take quite some time before I start to see that shrinkage happen. So I think they definitely are worth the investment. They are a little bit pricey. If you've never purchased molds like these, you'll be a little bit sticker shocked. So if this is something that you're just starting out doing, you're not sure that you even want to go down this road of making your own jars, I would recommend starting out with something a little bit cheaper like an Amazon mold. Um, I do have one linked down below in the storefront that I started out using. So that's a good one to try out if this is brand new to you. But if this is something that you're considering doing long term, and you want to invest in some good quality molds, I cannot recommend these enough. I will be making a separate video on these molds that I recently just got. It is also a three inch tulip mold, but it's from Canadian silicone molds. And the reason this one is different is because my logo is actually embedded into the mold. So these are custom and when you unmold them, this is how the jars turn out. So I'm absolutely obsessed with how these are looking and the end goal is to eventually have all of my jars be custom like this so I might end up phasing out the Modern Craft Labs jars I don't know we'll see but I've really been loving how these have been turning out so again I'll be sure to make a video for you guys on this mold Next, I have my distilled water. I choose to use distilled water because where I live, we have really hard tap water. And I found that it was leaving water spots on my jars. And I'll go into detail about that a little bit later on in the video, but I like to use distilled water. I have some solo cups. This one has the distilled water in it. I just find it a little bit easier to use this to pour into the bowls and then I have a couple on hand for my spatulas when I'm done mixing. And then this little bowl set I got from Amazon. I love these things. They are really easy to use. They're really flexible, so they're nice for pouring and also for cleaning up. Then I have a scale for weighing out my ingredients and I have some spatulas. These are a little bit used and abused. I probably need to order more, but I really like using these for mixing. Now this little guy is totally optional. This is actually a little vibrating machine that is used in the dental field. And this just helps to get some of the bubbles out of your molds, but don't feel like you have to go out and buy one of these. You can just do the tap and bounce method and that will work just fine. I also have some pigments. I like to use direct colors pigments. I just have really had the best experience 
pigments with them. I have some more pigments over here as well in these little plastic containers. These are the ones that I typically use the most. Now this is something somewhat new to me. I just recently have started using this in my mixture. And this is by the same company that makes cement all. It's called Flow Control. I also purchased this from Home Depot. And what it is is a water reducing additive. So this is going to increase the fluidity of your mixture without needing to add more water. So this has been such a lifesaver. If you've watched my previous videos, you've probably heard me mention before bad bags of cement all. And what I mean by that is they just aren't performing like they normally do. They're really hard to mix. It gets really thick and sets up really fast. And cement all is not normally like that. So I don't know what it is, but this winter, every bag I've gotten has been like that. And I was returning them to Home Depot, but then it was just one after another. So I was thinking I need to find something that is gonna work and let me be able to use these bags. And this has been it. So I just add this in just a little bit and it helps to make the mixture more fluid. So we might need to end up using this today. We'll see when we get to mixing, but this stuff has just been so awesome. Okay, so I have my bowl on the scale ready to weigh out my ingredients. And this is something that I have changed from my older tutorials. I now weigh everything out and it just really has helped to cut down on waste. I used to eyeball it, which did work for me until I switched to two-toned jars. Then I kind of needed to weigh out how much of each color I needed and so on. So I've really enjoyed doing it this way now. Again, it just helps to cut down on waste. So let's go ahead and turn on our scale. And I officially have my mask on now, so I might sound a little bit muffled, but for this tulip mold, the three inch one, I typically use about 260 grams of cement all. So I'm gonna go ahead and weigh that out. On the dot. Okay, and let's go ahead and add some pigment to this jar so you guys can see how I do that. I know there are some people that like to add their pigment to their water and then add the water to the dry cement all, but I find adding it to the dry mixture is easier and it just kind of incorporates better. So I'm gonna go ahead, zero out my scale. And I'm gonna weigh out about one gram of this titanium dioxide. And what titanium dioxide does is it just lightens the jar. There we go. And then this is gonna be direct colors number 114. And I'm gonna do one gram of this color as well. And this is gonna give us sort of a nude color. Sometimes the scale is delayed, so I wait a second to see. Oh, that's probably good enough. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is mix this together before we add our water in. So I'm gonna go ahead and give this a good mix. An important thing to remember about pigments is that you should really only be using up to 5% of pigment. Otherwise you can really weaken your vessel. So we had 260 grams of cement all. So our max load for pigment should be no more than 13 grams. If you add anything more than that, you really are gonna compromise the integrity of your jar. So we only added two grams of pigment. I, you would really have to add a lot to get to 13 grams. I've never really reached that point, but just wanted to share that. Okay, now we are ready for our water. So with cement all, it's typically a four to one ratio. So four parts cement all, one part water. I usually like to start with about 50 grams of water and then 
kind of adjust it from there. And then after I start mixing is usually when I can tell if I need to add the flow control. Okay, so let's start mixing. I'm gonna take it off the scale. It's just a little easier to mix when it's on the table. So you can see it's kind of really thick and it's not really mixing very well. This is what I mean by the bad bags of cement all because it usually mixes up really well and becomes fluid and this kind of just stays in one big thick clump. So now the reason I prefer to use a spatula when I'm mixing is it's really easy to get clumps out. So if you're mixing and you see a clump, you can just kind of smash it against the side of the bowl and wiggle it a little bit. And it just helps to get your mixture as clump free as possible. So I'm gonna add a little bit more water. Just a little splash. And you can see it's still, it's just not incorporating that great. So you really have to work at it. You usually don't have to work at it this much. So starting to come together though. I don't know that we'll need to add that flow control. So it's looking pretty good. Maybe just a little bit. There are some people that recommend using a drill attachment to mix, especially if you're making large batches. I have tried that before, but I just found it to create too many bubbles in my mixture. So I prefer to hand mix and I normally do three jars at a time, but just for this video, I'm doing one, but I really don't mind hand mixing. Okay, so you can see it is already starting to kind of set up and get really thick and it's gonna be hard to pour. So I am gonna add just a touch of that powder. So I'm just gonna do a little sprinkle of that. I have found if you add too much of that stuff, it kind of leaves a weird look to your jars. So I just try to be very minimal with it. I'm just gonna add a touch more. And the consistency we're looking for here is, I used to say pancake, but really now I kind of do more of like a thick milkshake consistency. So this is looking pretty good. I think we are ready to pour. Okay, so I have my mold on the vibrating machine and I just like to turn it on low and it kind of just helps the mixture get into the mold a little bit better. So you can already see again, this is starting to get thick already. So these bags have just been a pain. Now, as we get to the top here, you wanna make sure that you're not underfilling or overfilling your mold just to avoid having to do a lot of sanding. Now, this is what I like to do after I've poured it all in. I still have this on the low setting and I just like to kind of spin it around and smack the side of it, kind of like you're burping a baby. And I just find that that helps to get the bubbles out and then give it a couple bounces and you should be good. So I'll go ahead and put on that little outer shell. And then we will come back when that is ready to unmold. For me, it usually is about three to four hours. I just make sure that the mold is no longer warm to the touch and that's how I know it is ready to come out. Now, in the meantime, I will show you guys how I clean up. So I have this trash can beside my workbench and I just kind of scrape out as much as I can with my spatula. You can even take a paper towel and kind of wipe out the inside of the bowl. 
So I scrape out what I can and then I take this outside and hose it off into the dirt. Of course it just started raining out here, so I'll be quick. I just hose it off right into the dirt. Never ever want to rinse any of this out in any type of sink. The concrete is going to harden in your pipes and that is just a disaster waiting to happen. Okay, so it's been about four hours and I'm making sure it's no longer warm and it's not. So it is time to unmold. I'm gonna take off that outer shell. And then the way that I like to do it is just kind of start pulling apart the top here just to release it a little bit. And then once you have the top all released, I just kind of use the palms of my hands and push on it to roll it down. And then I kind of hold that down and roll down the other side. So then we're left with this. And then I flip it around and just start pulling up on the mold. And then just give it a twist. And there we go. Now the bottoms are pretty smooth, but I'm just gonna go over it with a little sanding block just to make sure that it's not sharp at all. So I literally just kind of go in a circle, just a couple times. And now it's all smooth. And that is our finished product. I also wanted to add that the color will lighten up after it starts to dry out. As soon as you take it out of the mold, it's going to be darker than the actual color is going to be. So it's going to lighten up to something similar to this. This is what I use for my Ola Vista jar. It's just that nude color swirled with some white. So now let's discuss some common issues that you may experience when making these jars. Let's start with cracking. So say you've poured your molds, you go do something else, you come back to check on them an hour, an hour and a half later, and you notice that there are cracks right here on the bottom of the jars or at the top of the molds, it is most likely caused from them drying too quickly. So believe it or not, weather has a lot to do with making these jars. I didn't realize that at first when I started making them, and I definitely learned that through experience. So if you live somewhere where it's really hot and dry, your jars are gonna cure faster than somebody that lives where it's really cold. So I get asked that question quite often, how long do you leave them in the molds before you remove them? And it really depends on where you live and a good way to find out if they're ready to come out is to feel the mold I usually will pick it up and feel the inside of it and if it's still warm it's not ready to come out if it's not warm anymore it's ready to take out but if your jars are drying too fast you can experience cracking right here so I've even had this happen to me in the summertime, if it's really hot in August, September. Um, I live in Southern California, but the last couple years we have had really hot summers towards the end of the summer. So I have personally experienced cracking and my best tip is to pour during the cooler times of the day. So I usually will try to pour early in the morning or later in the evening depending on what the weather is like that day and that is my best tip to combat that issue. Hi future editing Brie here. I realized I forgot to add that if you are experiencing cracking on the bottoms of your jars you can try using plastic wrap. So after your mold has started to for about 15 to 20 minutes or so. You can put a piece of plastic wrap on the top of your mold and it should help to prevent those cracks from happening. Next we have marks and spots. So if you are experiencing these line looking marks on your jars and you're wondering what the heck happened, it is most likely from your nails. If you have longer nails, you have to really be careful when you're unmolding your jars because if you just swipe it, I just did it here, it leaves a mark. 
So definitely watch out for that. Now you could also be experiencing water spots on your jars. And this is something that was happening to me when I first started making these. We have really hard water here and I was using tap water when I was making my jars. It was leaving behind all kinds of water spots on my jars. You could really see it on the darker colored ones but also on the lighter ones as well. So I made the switch to distilled water and I have not had that issue since. So if you are experiencing water spots, go ahead and try using distilled water or filtered bottled water and see if that makes that issue disappear. So again, kind of something that depends on where you live. I know there are lots of people that are able to use their tap water and they have no issues, but for me, it was causing those spots. So that is why I switched to distilled water. Next on the list, we have bubbles. If you are experiencing lots of bubbles or holes on your jars, they could be caused by a couple different reasons. The first being you're not tapping or bouncing your mold either at all or for as long as you should be. When you're pouring your mixture into the mold, there's also air getting in there. So you wanna make sure that you're tapping the sides of your mold and bouncing it on a table a couple times to really help release those air bubbles. When those air bubbles are left in the mold, that's how you get the bubbles on your jars. So the more you tap and bounce, the more those bubbles are gonna come out and you're gonna be left with a really smooth jar, which is what we want. Sometimes you have to watch out for those bubbles because if they're too big, it can really weaken the vessel specifically where that bubble is and you're gonna be left with just a little bit of a wall of your concrete, which might impact your candle in the future. So definitely watch out for that. Also, if you have really large bubbles, depending on where they are on your jar, they can actually be kind of sharp. So if a customer accidentally runs their finger over it, it might cut them. So definitely something to watch out for. The second reason might surprise you, but it could actually be the vibrating machine. And you may be thinking, wait, you were using that earlier to help get the bubbles out. I was, and it works well for that if you don't overdo it. If you leave the mold on there for too long or you use it on too high of a setting, you can actually end up creating more bubbles, which is something that I have experienced before, and it ends up leaving tons of little tiny bubbles right here on the bottom of the jar and on the very bottom as well. So definitely make sure that you're only using it for a minimal amount of time on the low setting and you should be good. Next we have rough bottoms. Rough bottoms can occur from either underfilling or over filling your molds. So it is important to figure out with your particular molds where that perfect spot is to stop pouring in order to avoid these issues. For me, I have found that sweet spot with my molds. So I have very minimal sanding to do. Just a quick swipe or two right here around the bottom and I have really smooth bottoms. When you underfill or overfill, you're gonna be left with really sharp and jagged bottoms. So that is definitely something to watch out for because again, you do not want to injure a customer. Even when you try to sand, it still is gonna leave kind of sharp edges. So try to figure out that spot to stop pouring and it will definitely help you avoid these issues. My last two points are issues that you may encounter while you're burning your candles. The first one being the jar starting to crack. I personally haven't experienced this, but I have seen pictures online and I've had people reach out to me asking what the cause could be. And in my opinion, I think it could be caused by too large of a wick or something about your mixture wasn't right, whether it was the ingredients or you added too much water. So if this is something that you are experiencing, try wicking down or try revisiting your ratios and your mixture to see if that fixes that problem. My second point is the sealer bubbling. And this is something that I have dealt with in the past. And it was because I was not letting my jars dry out long enough before sealing. And I was only letting them dry 24 hours and then sealing them. And that was way too soon. Again, this is something that is kind of weather dependent, but you wanna make sure that your jars have enough time to completely dry out before you seal them. I used to wait 
about three days or so, but now I really wait a week, I would say, just to be sure that they are completely dry before I seal. Because if you seal too soon and you're burning your candle and you see the sealer starting to bubble up, it's because there's still moisture trapped in your jar and it's trying to escape. So definitely make sure you're giving them enough time to dry out. If you're unsure how long you should wait, you can actually weigh your jars each day. And when the weight starts to level off, that's how you know that they are dry and ready to go. Well, that concludes the video. I hope you guys found it helpful and enjoyed it. If you did, feel free to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I really appreciate it. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye.